still working. How about now? Good. You can hear me? Yeah. All right, good. Let me start by saying how uh, what a blessing it is for me to be able to come here today and and speak for you. This congregation means so much to me. Uh, I call this congregation home. And they don't like it back in Zachary when I say uh, call this home because they tell us that that's our home. But in reality, this is home. And uh, I hear things that go on here back at back in Zachary. And uh, uh, my heart's with you. Uh, I know that you've lost a lot of good soldiers of the cross here lately. Uh, the passing of Brother Ed Ballard sure hit me hard, and as well as Jerry Spellings and, and others. And uh, you know, those two men that I mentioned, they especially meant a lot to me because uh, when I first started attending this congregation, uh, it was Brother Ed who I went into his office one day and I told him about my, my tarnished past, and I said, I'm just scared to death that I'm going to go back to all that. What do I do? And, and it was Ed who told me, he said, well, well, just, you know, come to church every time the doors are open, get involved in everything. Uh, whatever's going on outside the services, take part in that. If they ask you to do something, do it. Uh, volunteer for things and just stay busy. And you won't have to, you won't, you'll be so self-conscious about getting your life right that you won't worry about all those other things. So, so that's what I did. And, and uh, you know, getting out of my comfort zone and getting used to that, I think all that advice that Ed gave me that day uh, really kind of uh, may have been the greatest influence to, to get to meet me to where I am today. So I just can't say enough about Ed. I miss him dearly. Uh, and Jerry Spellings, of course, he was one of the people who uh, recommended me to the Memphis School of Preaching. Uh, so those both of those men meant so much to me, and I hate that I wasn't, wasn't able to be here uh, during that, the time of their passing. <clears throat> well, several, it's been, it seems like it's been forever now that, that Ray asked me to speak on this topic what's right with the church and uh you know it sounds like a, maybe it sounds to you like it'd be an easy topic to address uh but it really wasn't it's caused me a lot of study uh there's times when i just about to pull my hair out where do i go with this six lessons on what's right with the church and and uh well i, I think I, I think i've got something that's going to edify us and my purpose throughout this series of lessons is to kind of change our uh, change our view towards the church uh, not in a bad way, but uh, to start looking at the church maybe from God's perspective instead of ours. I think many times we uh, look at the church, and, and when we think of the church, and, we, and what we think about is what we see happening among the church, among brethren, and most of the time it's negative, the things that we take notice of. A lot of that has to do with our attitude and what we perceive. Uh, but uh, we're going we're gonna to talk about some of these things and kind of try to change our perspectives on it a lot, but as we begin with this first uh, lesson this morning, examining the question, what's right with the church? During the weeks leading up to this meeting, maybe you've thought about this topic. I hope that you have. What's right with the church? I hope that maybe you've made, asked yourself some questions. Uh, maybe try to make a list of things that's right with the church. Maybe you've thought about things that you like about this congregation. Uh, maybe you have th thought about things that, uh, you know, Christendom in general has the effects that it's had on the world throughout the ages. And maybe you've listed some of these things in your mind. And I'm certain that if you were to place your list next to my list, next to other people's list, that we'd find a lot of differences. You know, because what you like about the church may not necessarily be what I like about it. And, uh, and so on and so forth. So, uh, you know, what we, what we, if we're ever going to be able to answer this question, what's right with the church, I think we're going to have to, you know, define our terms in this, in this question. Uh, and when I studied a class in logic, uh, one of the first things I was told was many times people argue and they're saying the same thing. Uh, but it's ambiguous terms that's the problem. Uh, so we need, you know, one of the first things you need to do is clearly define your terms. Uh, so that's what I want us to do this morning. When we ask the question, what's right with the church? Let's first look at what's right. What's right? You know, we live in a day and age where everyone does right in their own sight. You know, I do what I, you know, speaking generally, I do what I want to do. You do what you want to do. You leave me alone, I'll leave you alone, and, and we'll get along. Everything will be, will be fine. This mindset pervades the denominational world. We see it when we hear phrases like, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, become a Christian and then join the church of your own choice. You know, uh, what uh, it's presented to us as if any whatever you want to do is fine, just as long as you do it in the name of the Lord in the sense that, you know, say, praise God, hallelujah, yes, I'm doing it. This mindset uh, is often even seen in the church. Uh, some congregations, uh, when you travel from city to city, there's a lot of congregations that are slipping into this idea of fellowshipping with denominations. Uh, they call it unity and diversity. And, uh, of course, that's really the same mindset. It's not identifying sin. It's not identifying that there is an absolute truth. There's been lots of different roads. You go by your road, I'll go by my road. I believe it was Oprah Winfrey on one occasion was asked and asked about this, and she said there's many ways to get to heaven. Well, that's what I want to talk about. What's right with the church? First of all, is there something that's absolutely right? Uh, because it's going to affect the answers that we come up with. Uh, we're not talking about what's right with the church from your point of view, from my point of view. What's right in the church from God's point of view? That's what's really important. And this modern view... Uh, that we see in the world today with everybody doing what's right in their own sight. Uh, you know, it's, it's not just a modern idea. This is something that's been seen throughout history. We even have an example of this mindset right in the Bible. If you would look at John chapter eight, uh, 18, and you'll see another individual there who had this same idea that truth is relative. Uh, truth is subjective. Uh, it's not concrete. It's not absolute. Uh, there's, you have your right. I have my right. <clears throat> John chapter 18, verses 37 through 38. Pilate therefore said unto him, that is Jesus, Art thou a king then? And Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end I was born. And for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. But Pilate said unto him, notice, what is truth? What is truth? See, Jesus presented an absolute concrete truth. Uh, one, that's, one that does not change. It's, it's truth. And uh, he called it the truth. Notice, singular and the definite article, the, in front of it. He, if he didn't use an indefinite article like a, he didn't talk about a truth. He didn't talk about one truth among many truths. He talked about the one truth. But Pilate, he had a completely different mindset on him. Pilate said, what is truth? Pilate, according to Pilate, truth is relative. You know, you have your truth. I, who can know the truth? Well, that's the mindset that I think we see a lot in the world today. Matter of fact, a neighbor uh, was standing at my door one day, and we were talking about... Uh, religion and politics, you know, those things that uh, you want to, if you really want to win friends and influence people, those are the topics you probably want to avoid, really. <laughs> but we were talking about politics and religion, and I forget what brought this up, but he made the statement, well, I just have a real problem with absolutes. I think that exemplifies the problem that I'm talking about this morning. And he had a problem with absolutes. I don't think he'd come up with that idea on his own. I think, he, he, I think he's been given a worldview by, by what's going on in our culture today. I think he picked that up from somewhere, but I kind of quizzed him about it. I said, are you absolutely sure there are no absolutes? And, uh, of course, uh, that's, a, that's a dilemma, uh, because if you say, I am absolutely sure there's no absolutes, well, you've made an absolute. If you say, no, I'm not absolutely sure that there's an absolute, well, you're leaving the possibility of an absolute. So what that indicates is then that that is a logical fallacy. That statement that, there, that, that, that statement that truth is relative is a logical fallacy. It cannot be. It cannot be the case that truth is relative. Truth is concrete. Consi to prove that, let me consider some points with you. Uh, people talk about relative tr uh, truth being relative, and they want to talk about being broad-minded instead of narrow-minded. Uh, consider this. Is there room for broad-mindedness in the chemical laboratory? Uh, maybe, I'm sure we all know that water, oxygen, or uh, water, H2O, is composed of two parts hydrogen, one part oxygen. That's absolute truth. You can't deviate from that in any way. I mean, you could put, you could put different 
of things together that you're not going to end up with water. If you want water, there's an absolute recipe for that, that those chemicals must be combined to make water. The slightest deviation in of it is forbidden. So it's an absolute truth. What about in the realm of music? You know, there's eight octaves uh, in, the, in, the, in the, or there's eight steps in an octave. Uh, a skilled music director, is it gonna allow some one person to uh, sing in a di different, uh, in a uh, half step up or a half step down? The precise formula must be followed. What about in the realm of mathematics? You know, if your child goes to school and they teach your child two plus two is, is four, or, or uh, if the textbook says two plus two is four, but you have one teacher that says, you know, well, your truth is relative. relative. You know, two plus two to me is five. Your two plus two is four, mine's five. Do you want your child being taught that way? Absolutely not, because we know in mathematics there's absolute truth. We could go on. There's absolute truth in the auto repair shop. My vehicle's getting worked on as we speak. And I hope they have it done soon, but you know, some of those uh, things in the motor, like uh, uh, the cylinders and the pistons and the rings, some of those have tolerances. And they have to be just a certain few thousands tolerance. Otherwise, the engine won't work. Uh, it's, not rel it's not relative. It's not subjective. You can't, you can't just do it like you want to do it. You've got to follow the formula. You've got to follow the pattern. <laughs> And so it is that truth is relative, or truth is absolute in all these realms. So then why is it that we, when we come to the religious circle, why is it all of a sudden that truth is relative? Why is it when we get into politics and religion that people want to say, well, you have your truth, I have my truth, your way is good for you, your way, my way is good for me. Why is it that it differs? Well, I think uh, if we really answer that truthfully, and uh, feel free to raise your hand and answer any, uh, any questions, give any thoughts if you want to throughout this. I think the, the truth is that if truth is relative, then that, makes, that empowers me to do what I want to do. It makes me my own God. But if there's an absolute truth, that, give, that makes me that I have to be submissive to God the Father. That makes me in subjection to him. And in our culture, I think we just want to do what we want to do. We don't want to be subject to anybody. We don't want to be submissive. <laughs> and again, I want to remind you where I'm going with this. We're talking about what's right with the church. We need to know, first of all, is there, is there such a thing as right? Because a lot of people in the world today are telling us that, that there is no <laughs> absolute right. And so uh, they would perhaps tell you what they liked about the church. That we want to know what God says is right about the church throughout this study. Consider a few other things about this. If there's not an absolute right, if there's not a right way, consider these implications. If there's no absolute truth, no absolute right, God's purpose in writing the Bible was an utter failure. God had wrote the Bible to communicate to man. And if, if he can't do that, if there's not an absolute truth, then is God really God? It also suggests that a man is able to better communicate with one another than the Spirit of God. Are we ready to affirm that? You know, I, I, I like books like The Lord of the Rings, the Harry Potter series. I really like those. Those are interesting uh, books to me. And and it's interesting when these movies, when these books are made into films, a lot of times people go and say, man, that was just like the book. Loved it. Or that was different than the book. I didn't like how they changed it here and there. The point I'm trying to make is we can all, millions of people can read Harry Potter and they can all come to the same conclusion about what, what the theme is, what's being taught, and they can understand when someone deviates from that. Why is it that we can't do it when we go to the Word of God? To say that we can't is to really blaspheme the Holy Spirit Himself. Can the Holy Spirit communicate to us in a way that we can all understand and come to the same conclusion? Consider this. If there's no absolute truth, then it makes Jesus' mission an absolute failure. Because Jesus came, 1 Timothy 2, 4, who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. But we can't come to the knowledge of the truth. At least that's what they tell us. 
We can't all agree on it because there's different truths, you see. So that would make Jesus Christ's mission an absolute failure. And uh, I, think, I don't think any of us are willing to say a blaspheme against the Holy Spirit, against Jesus Christ, the Son, and God the Father. But that's what we have to do if we want to say that truth is relative. Consider what these warnings in Scripture would mean if, if there was no absolute truth. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof is always death. What's that mean for us? Uh, that goes in a, a contradiction to what people are teaching us today. Uh, people tell us, to walk in your, own, in your own way. Do what you want to do. But the Bible says there's a way that seems right unto me, but it's not right. Consider this one. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 15. The way of the fool is right in his own eyes. But he that hearkeneth unto counsel is wise. Jeremiah 10, 23. Oh, Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his own steps. Jesus taught that there was an absolute truth. Objective. Concrete. Another verse that I want us to consider that proves this is John chapter 14, 6. Jesus said, I am the way the truth, and the life. No man cometh into the Father but by me. Jesus did not say that he was one way among many ways. Jesus did not say, I am one truth among many truths. Choose the truth of your own. Jesus did not say, I am one life among many lives. You choose the lifestyle that you like best. Jesus said, I am the truth, or the way, the truth, the life. Absolute, concrete, narrow-minded, call it what you want, but it's what Jesus said. It's the truth. Jesus' word is the source of all truth. Sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is truth. John 17, 17. Are we convinced yet? Is there an absolute truth? Uh, you may, I, I imagine probably all of us in this room agree wholeheartedly to this, but there's a great number of people out in the world uh, who are trying to tell us truth is relative. And that's why I think this is very important for us because, as Peter said, we, uh, we, uh, we ought to be ready to give an answer of the truth, of the hope that lies within us. Time may come. You may be called to give an answer toward this. Someone's going to tell you like my neighbor did, well, I think truth is relative. Or, I, I just have a real problem with absolutes. John chapter 8, verse 32, And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. It's interesting, the Greek word translated know here, you shall know the truth. The Greek word is gnosko. And Strong says of it, it's to absolutely know. Mounts said of it, complete and settled. So then we can know the truth and we can absolutely know it, and we can know it in a complete and settled way. <coughs> However, to do that, it's going to take a little effort on our part. And I think maybe the effort or the lack thereof may be one of the reasons that people try to deny this truth. To absolutely know something, it requires effort on our part. Matthew chapter 7, verse 7, Ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened unto you. Among the things which Paul told to, uh, the, to Timothy, he says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman, that needed not be ashamed, right in dividing the word of truth. See, that's some effort on our part. We can all absolutely know. We can all be in agreement with one another on what the scriptures say. But to do so, it requires work. It requires study. And the fact that this passage says, rightly dividing the word of truth, that implies something. To rightly divide implies that one can wrongly divide. And so... There is an absolute truth, and we, need, we have a responsibility that God has given us to study and to be able to discern what is that truth. John chapter 12, verse 48, tells us that God will, that His Word will judge us in the last day. Now, if that's not absolute, I don't know what it is. Any other, your truth, my truth, none of those truths are going to matter in the last day. The only truth that's going to matter is Jesus' truth. John 12, 48. 
You know, one of my instructors in school illustrated it this way, and, and I, I often use it. I love this. You know, in school, occasionally they would give us an open book test. You know, with an open book test, you can, you can, you can take your class textbook with you to the test, and you can open it and look up every single answer to the questions. And if you make a bad grade on that test, who do you have to blame for it? No one but yourself. And I have to say, I've known people, and at times I myself have even uh, done bad on open book tests. But why? Because you're lazy. You just don't, you just don't want to turn the pages. Well, John 12, 48 tells us that the judgment in the last day is an open book test. His words are going to judge us. If we make it to the last day and we don't know and we think, well, Lord, I thought that, it was, I thought that my truth would be fine. You don't have anyone to blame but yourself. Because these words are going to judge you. God's told us. And he's bound us. You know, think about this. He's bound himself to that as well. You know, some people have this illusion that they're going to get to the judgment and they're going to be able to talk God out of something. That uh, maybe they're going to say, well, God, my intent was. Uh, or God, I know what you said, but. Uh, but see, God has bound himself to this. When God says, I will judge you according to this criteria, guess what happens if he don't? He ceases to be God. He's a liar. So God has bound himself to his word, or Jesus has, when he says he will judge us by this word. Now that's an absolute truth. Don't let someone tell you that truth is relative. Don't let someone tell you that there's many ways and people are there are lots of people are traveling by these different ways, but they're all going to the same spot. Uh, there's one way, one truth, one lie. <coughs> <clears throat> Having established then, I think, what is right, uh, and that's what God determines is right, I think we should move on and, and look at the question again. What's right with the church? Another term, this, this, this lesson here is to just kind of, again, define terms uh, so that we're all on the same page the rest of these lessons. I want to look now at another word in it, the church. Church, you know, people look at, people hear that word church and different people conjure up different things in their mind about what that word means. What does it mean when the Bible says church? Well, you may, it may be of interest to you that the word church is derived from uh, a Greek word, kuriakos, which means of, the belong, of or belonging to the Lord. But it might really surprise you that that word is not found one time in all of Scripture. Not one time. And that's because that word was manufactured after the case, after the fact. You know, because uh, uh, they, they, they manufactured this word after New Testament times because they realized that sometimes this word that, that is translated church in our Bibles, sometimes it means what we're talking about we call the church, and sometimes it means something else. So they use this word to differentiate between two. The word in, in your Bibles that when you read the word church, most of the time, it is from the Greek word uh, ekklesia. Ekklesia. Now, ekklesia is a compound word. Uh, the first part of it, ek, that's a preposition. It means out, uh, out or from. The root, kaleo, means call. So you put those together, and what we're talking about is something that's called out. Something that's called out. We find it used in several senses in the Bible. In fact, in Acts chapter 19, verse 32, it's spoken of as a mob. You know, when Demetrius, the silversmith, uh, caused all that problem for Paul, and that, that mob got together, uh, it's called an ecclesia. It's a called out a group that was called out. It wasn't the called out body of Christ, but it was a called out body. And so ecclesia, and that kind of indicates maybe why they manufactured this word church to put in your Bibles. Uh, when it's not talking, when it's not talking about things like this, another way it's used in the Bible is talking about is talking about the universal church comprised of all believers in all congregations. Uh, one just citing one verse of this, Matthew chapter sixteen, verse eighteen. You remember that occasion when uh, Jesus said, "Who do men who do men say that I the Son of Man am?" And Peter said, "Thou art the Christ, the Son of the Living God." He said, Blessed are thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto thee, but my Father is in heaven. And he said, I shall call thee Peter. I will call thee Peter. 
Uh, and upon this rock I will build my church. Notice, singular, my church. It's a singular church. It's one. He's talking about the universal church. All <coughs> congregations under the umbrella of one uh, body. That is the body of Christ, the church. But sometimes the Bible talks about the church in a different sense. And that is in the local sense. It's calling individuals churches. And an example of this, uh, well, Paul wrote many letters. Churches. He wrote to the church of Ephesus. He wrote to the church of Galatia. He wrote to the Thessalonians and so on and so forth. And when we get to the book of Revelation, uh, we say, and we, we read in chapters 2 and 3, and to the angel of the church of Smyrna, right? And to the angel of the church of Philadelphia, right? And so on and so forth. So the Bible uses the word church in, in several senses. Three, to be exact, the universal church, the local church, and an assembly, a mob even. Three senses the word church is used in the Bible. But there's two, two senses in which the church is never the church is never used. But we see it used today in the world in which we live. The first is of a building. We, we often talk about we're going to church. We're going to church. The building. The building is not the church. And it helps us to understand that the building is not the church. Uh, I've had people say, I can't believe he said that, and he said it in the church of all places. You know, this place is not a holy place. Our union, the assembly, we are the living stones. We are what's holy, said so part of God, not this building. We could worship under a shade tree, and it would be just as much the church assembly as it is in here. And I've heard people say, oh, no, you can't have your wedding in this church because you want instrumental music playing, and we don't do that. So you can't have it in this church. Well, this is a building. If we can't differentiate between the building and what the actual church is, we're going to cause ourselves some problems. We're going to bind where God has it bound and uh, loose where God has it loose and so on and so forth. So that's one sense in which the church is never used in the Bible. Another sense is the denominational sense. Now the church, did you know that the word church is never used in the denominational sense in all of your Bible? Think about this. The denominations, uh, they claim to be part of the universal church. They say the universal church is comprised of Baptists, Methodists, Presbyterians, and you, you can name it probably more than I can. Uh, and they say that they're all part of the universal church. But think about this. Each one of the denominations is made up of a whole bunch of individual local, local churches, right? So what we have with denominations is something that exists between the universal church and the local church. There is, no, there is no level between the universal church and the local church in all of Scripture. There's the local, there's the local, and there's the universal. But in a denominational world, you have the universal, the denominational, and the local. That's not Scripture. That's not biblical. We have no authority for denominations. They are established by men. They exist without the blessing of God and are completely unknown to the Word of God. Our study this week, again, is what's right with the church. We could, we could spend a lot of time talking about what I like about it, and there's a lot of things that I like about this congregation. A lot of things that I like about the congregation back in Zachary. There's a lot of things that you like about it. Uh, but we're not going to talk about what we, what we individually like about the church. What we want to talk about this week is what God likes about the church. And hopefully, if we quit looking at it about Quit looking at it from the, from the perspective of what I like and start looking about it, looking at it from the perspective of what God likes. Maybe we can increase our faith. Maybe we can start overlooking some of the things that cause us trouble, hindrances, things that discourage us. And maybe we can start looking at the bigger picture and what we can do and what we should be doing in the church. What's right with the church? In the next hour... It looks like I'm finishing up a little bit earlier here. Y'all think about some questions you might want to ask me. How much time do I have, brother? We've got about six minutes. Oh, okay. Not too bad, then. Good. I'm starting to sweat a little up here. <laughs> in, the, in the next hour, I think it would be appropriate for us to address then uh, how, do I, how, do I, how can I be sure that I'm in the right church? Since we know there's an absolute right, and since we know that God wants us to be in the church, there must be a right church. How do we know which one it is? You know, I, when I read my Bible and read about churches such as 
Corinth, uh, I have to think, would I have ever placed membership at Corinth? Think about that. Would you have placed membership there? They had so many problems. They had division. They were making a meal out of the Lord's Supper. Uh, so on, uh, on and on and on we could go. Uh, they had a, an adulterer in their midst, and instead of uh, and instead of trying to uh, uh, to uh, discipline that person, they wanted to accept them and call them say, "Oh, we're just a loving congregation. We say we accept everybody." They had so many problems. Would we have placed membership there? But uh, I noticed that uh, that in his letter to them, he didn't say this congregation is absolutely lost. Every one of you. Are, are destined to hell if you don't change. He, he did tell them if they didn't change, in so many words. Uh, but he didn't tell them they were in a lost condition. He didn't send out letters to the community saying, don't place membership at this congregation. They are way off. Well, they still had hope. They still had hope. They, they had some things they needed to get in order, but God hadn't wrote them off completely yet. I think about uh, uh, one of the churches in the, in the book of Revelation. I don't remember exactly which one it was at this point. I think it may have been Sardis. But at any rate, uh, that congregation, which one was the dead, was the dead church? Sardis. Sardis? Sardis? Okay. Uh, that church was called dead. And uh, they were told to repent. But guess what? It says, some of you are still faithful and they will walk with me in white. So I think sometimes we might think, man, this church has so many problems. Uh, it can't have God's blessings. It must be something wrong. Uh, there wouldn't be this many problems. So maybe I'm lost simply because I'm here. You go somewhere else. Read Revelation. Read about Sardis. Is that true? No, it's not true. You need to concern, be concerned about you. And that might lead us to another lesson later on. Am I what's right with the church? Or am I part of the problems? Uh, do we have any questions? Yes. I think one thing, Bruce, about this absolutes, you know, back in the late 60s and early 70s, back when I went to college and everything, they were pushing all this situation ethics and no absolutes. And it's kind of mushroom from all that. And if we will study the Bible, instead of studying all the philosophies of men, we won't be so swayed about that. But it's easy to see. People will say, it's not like it used to be. But in truth, it's exactly like it's always been. The, the, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life, it just cased in different packages. It's still the same thing such as the, the thing you're talking about there. I mean, we went back to uh, New Testament times and we saw the exact same mindset was there and exemplified in Pilate. What is truth? You know, that's the same thing they're teaching in our colleges today, even our Bible colleges. It's not a new thing. It goes all the way back to, I'm sure, before even the first century. I have five minutes. Okay. Yes? I've noticed in the last couple of years that there's been a lot of how little you'll hear someone answer yes or no to a question, they'll say absolutely. Mm -hmm. And yet some of those people probably don't believe in absolute truth. But you listen to how little the words yes or no are used. The word absolutely is used. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you just get me written. People don't really want you to affirm anything today. Uh, so you step on somebody's toes when you affirm it. But we can't live, our, we can't do what Christ has called us to do without accepting absolutes. Because if I don't view those uh, that are uh, not adhering to the absolute truth as lost, if I can't accept the fact that they're absolutely lost, I'm not going to have the, the zeal to, to, uh, to go out and do evangelism as I should. Uh, you're never going to evangelize unless you realize that some people are absolutely lost, they're absolutely going to go to hell, if you don't do something about it. And so that's uh, compounding the problem. Anything, any other comments? Bruce, in as much as we have husbands and wives, the absolute, my wife takes, took on my last name, just so it. Mm -hmm. And God put the husband to be head of the church, head of the family, like he's the head of the church. Mm -hmm. You were probably covering what the bride is, the right bride, the right groom. 
and we have different lives, but if someone said to Miss Sawyer, please come here, all the other brides or women would not come. They would miss Sawyer. Mm -hmm. And that's what we see in the church. Absolutely. There's an absolute to every sense. Uh, but when it comes to religion, uh, we can't we can't do that. <laughs> Anything else? Well, I'm gonna go ahead and dismiss our job. Just sit here and speak for no reason. Sorry that I didn't give you all your money for it. I'm